Hello once again. Today we uh, wrap up the, our lectures on Christianity and ethics, and I want to turn to a very particular form of Christianity, or a very particular Christian, and how his influence uh, has affected uh, Christianity and, and thinking about Christian ethics, and that is Martin Luther. Now, I am a Lutheran pastor, and uh, the graduate work I have done, uh, which backs up a lot of the teaching I do here at this college, is in Luther's theology, Luther's understanding of um, God and God's work in Christ, and even some of Luther's ethics. And uh, it's w the topic I'm probably most passionate about when it comes to this course, and I wish we could just spend the whole eight weeks thinking about Luther and how Luther's thought applies to ethical issues. But uh, that's, uh, the, the course has to be a bit more broad than that, so um, I've decided, however, I want to take just one little session here and uh, acquaint you a little with some of Luther's thought as it pertains to ethics. Uh, because our, our textbook really doesn't cover this at all either, and while well, I think it is so important, I want to spend a little time with it. So, um, first of all, maybe just a little bit of history about Martin Luther, um, because some of you may know a great deal about him, many of you may not. First of all, I'm not talking about Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights leader from the 1960s, but I'm talking about a German monk who lived back in the 1500s. Uh, in fact, he was born in probably around 1483, we think. Um, and he did the majority of his work, or his most significant work, from oh, just before 1520 into the 1540s. Um, Luther is really the man who is responsible, or thought to be responsible, for the beginning of the great historical movement we call the Reformation. And I don't know really if it makes sense to think about it this way or not, but traditionally it's the way it's done. Um, in, on Halloween, on October 31st, the year 1517, Martin Luther posted 95 theses, 95 statements of his beliefs on the church doors, the castle church doors in Wittenberg, Germany. Um, and he put them up there as a public protest, actually not out to reform the whole, ch whole church, but he simply wanted an academic debate over these 95 issues he had concerns about. And... Um, but that day in history is often seen as the beginning of the Reformation and uh, something that ultimately led to the Roman Catholic Church of the day, in which Luther was a monk at the time, uh, splitting and, and becoming uh, uh, two large movements and then splitting many more times soon afterwards as other people followed in Luther's steps, uh, raising concerns about church practice and belief. So. What I want to think about today is how does Luther's theology impact thinking about moral issues, ethical issues? And it seems to me the place to start that is with something that stood at the very heart of Luther's own thinking. It's not something Luther comes up with on his own. He gets this out of the Bible, particularly from Paul's writings in the New Testament. But Luther, following Paul, made a very strong distinction between law and gospel. And I want to start talking off about what those two things mean, but even more importantly, how those two things function. And that was the real deep insight Luther brought into this distinction, was seeing that what's really important here is the way these things function in life. And I would argue in many ways this may be the greatest gift Luther gave to the church, was his distinction between the function of the law and the function of the gospel. So let's begin with a definition. First of all, if you were in the classroom, I would simply throw out to you this question. What does gospel mean? And hopefully, someone eventually would get around to the answer. Gospel literally means good news. It's not a religious word. In the Greek of the New Testament, the word is euangelion, from which in our language we get evangelical. But to us, that's become a very religious word. In the Greek language, it's not a religious word at all. It simply means good news. And if you think about this, the people who wrote stories of Jesus' life that now appear in the Bible, in the New Testament, titled them the Evangelion of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. Those authors were convinced that 
Jesus' life and Jesus himself was good news. Now, what I want to think about with you is how does good news function? What does it do? And if we were in a classroom right now, I would ask you this question. I would say, what would be really good news for you right now? And I'll just tell you how that's typically answered in my classes. Typically, a student will raise his, his or her hand almost immediately and say, class is over? <laughs> and of course, that would be good news. Um, and uh, the reason that would be good news for the students is because they wouldn't have to sit and listen to me anymore. They wouldn't have to take any notes. They would be freed from that. A burden would be lifted, the burden of listening to me and having to learn something in class. Um, I'll ask the question again, what else would be good news for you? And usually a student will raise a hand and say something like, this class isn't going to have a final exam. And again, that would be very good news for our students. And I'm sure even the online part of this test, if you heard there was going to be no, no, um, no test at the end, you'd be very happy to hear that as well. Sorry, I don't have that kind of good news for you. Um, but again, why would not having a final exam be good news? Because it would free you. It would lift a burden. You wouldn't have to study and prepare and learn all this stuff for that test. Uh, when I go out to churches and do uh, adult forums or teach things on Sunday mornings, I'll often ask the same kind of question to people, what would be good news? And usually the first answer I get there is someone raising their hand and saying, I won the lottery. <laughs> and again, why would that be good news? Because I wouldn't have to work anymore. I can pay off all my bills. I could get a new car, a new house. I could go on that long-awaited vacation. Um, all kinds of burdens would be lifted and freedom would be given to do all kinds of things I want to do. It seems to me that's how good news functions. It frees. It lifts burdens. And those who wrote the stories of Jesus life in the New Testament were convinced that Jesus frees, that he lifts burdens. And ultimately what comes with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is that Jesus has saved us from having to save ourselves. Jesus has saved us from the law and its power to condemn. Jesus has freed us from the grave and its power to keep us from life. And this gift, this good news from Jesus, is an absolutely free gift. There's nothing we can do to get it, to earn it, to merit it. It is simply a gift given to us through the promise of his cross and his empty tomb. I would argue this good news is so good, it's unbelievable. And that's why we need to hear it again and again and again, because it's almost impossible to convince us there isn't something we need to do. But the promise of the good news is there is nothing we need to do. The gift has been given us through what Jesus did in his cross and his empty tomb. Now, so ultimately, the good news, the gospel, saves us from sin saves us from the law and its power to condemn, saves us from death and the grave. So if that's what the gospel is, what then is law? First of all, law has a particular sound. Law usually comes across this way, you shall or you shall not. Right? And you've probably memorized or at least heard of the Ten Commandments at one time or another. Um, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not commit adultery. Thou shalt not. That's the form of the law. Um, but sometimes it comes in another way. It says you shall. And it drives us to do things. You shall remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. There we have the instructions to do something, not to refrain from doing something. But it seems to me the law does one of two things. Either it constrains us, restrains us, hold us holds us back, or it pushes us and pushes us and pushes us. Now for Luther, the law had two primary functions. The first function 
is what he called its civil use. It makes us civil. It helps us figure out how to live together, being the sinners that we are. And so, for instance, the speed limit is a civil use of the law. We drive only so fast, and obeying all the traffic laws makes life work in a world where we drive cars and trucks and SUVs and all the different things we drive to get around in our modern world. But when I come up to the stop sign, I stop. And it allows someone else to go through because if we both try to go through at the same time, it's just not going to work and someone's going to get hurt or killed. The civil use of the law makes life livable among sinners. But note this, the civil use of the law is never meant to get rid of sin. That's Jesus' work in his cross. The law is only meant to control sin, to restrain it and control it, control it enough that we can somehow make life in this world work. That's the first use of the law, to make life civil. The second use of the law is what Luther called its spiritual or theological use. This is that ability of the law to point its finger at us and accuse us of sin. In fact, one line Luther used to say over and over and over again was, the law always also accuses. The law always also accuses. The law points out our own sin. So, when you're driving down the freeway and you suddenly notice flashing red lights in the rearview mirror, where's the first place your eyes go? Yes, to the speedometer. And if you are going over the speed limit, you know what those red flashing lights in the rear view mean. The law is pointing its finger and you are guilty. You have broken the law and he's coming to get you. Or she, perhaps. Okay? Um, that's how law works. But as such, the law holds us back. Um, and I'll admit, I speed all the time, but usually only about five miles an hour over the speed limit. Um, I sometimes would like to go faster, but I don't want to get a ticket. So the law keeps me um, from breaking the law within reason. Hmm? That's one of the ways the law restrains. But the law also drives and drives and drives. And so if you want to do well in this course, you will read what is assigned. <laughs> you will do all the work required of you. You will study for that final exam. And... And, and that's an example of the law driving and driving and driving. If you were an athlete or a musician, you know what it's like to practice something over and over and over again until you get good at it. That is the law driving. And finally, the law is going to drive all of us into the grave. That's as far as we can ever get with the law. Getting beyond the grave is a gift of the gospel and the work of Jesus Christ. Okay? But so now here's the point I want to make with all of this. Ethics and morality has nothing to do with the gospel. It's a matter, ethics and morality are a matter of how to make life work in this messed up world of ours, in this sinful world of ours. So ethics are a matter of the law. And the ethical systems we pursue or use to live this life will not get us into heaven, will not score us any points or favor with God. And Luther was always very clear about that, that what we do in this life is never, ever going to save us. Ethics and the law are simply intended to make life in this world work. Now, because Luther taught this way, some came to call his ethics as godless, simply because in his mind, whatever ethics you live by, whatever moral rules guide your life, they're not going to get you into heaven. They're not going to gain you any points or favor from God. They're simply going to help you live life in this world. And based on Luther's whole way of thinking, and this is the radicality of the gospel. And this really doesn't come from Luther. This comes from Paul. But Luther lifts up what Paul said. 
that if everything is done for us and give us, given us in Christ, then literally, at least to gain heaven, to gain God's favor, we don't have to do anything. We don't have to do anything. Everything has been done for us in Christ. So here's the question at the heart of Luther's ethics. Now that we don't have to do anything, what are we going to do? How are we going to live with this incredible freedom God has given us through the gospel of Jesus Christ? With nothing we have to do, what are we going to do? And the question that really stood at the heart of Luther's way of dealing with this incredible freedom that we have in the gospel was this. How can I best love my neighbor? How can I best love my neighbor? Now that Christ has done all things for me and I don't have to worry about myself at all anymore, what can I do for my neighbor? And for Luther, really, living the ethical life means never, ever asking, what am I going to get out of it? Because I already have everything in Christ. I can forget about me and simply ask the question, what does my neighbor need from me? And if my neighbor needs my very life itself, I will give it. Because I know that I am already perfectly well taken care of in Christ, who has already given all things to me. That's radical. And it seems to me that's some of the freedom that comes with Luther's ethics is that we're freed finally from even having concern for ourselves. And that's not a very American way to think about things. Our culture teaches us to look out for number one first. I always ask first, what am I going to get out of it? And as I said in one of the earlier lectures, I think we're all um, utilitarian in a sense, but individualistic utilitarians asking, how can I get the greatest amount of happiness, least amount of pain for me? Luther's ethics don't start there. Luther's ethics laid me aside, recognizing all that Christ has already done before me. And Luther's ethics focus only on the neighbor and what the neighbor needs from me. So for Luther, what makes an act good is doing it simply because the neighbor needs it. For Luther, if you feed the hungry, or clothe the naked, or go to church and teach Sunday school, or give your offering in the church offering plate, or whatever you do to do good things, if you're doing that just finally to gain points with God, or get a thank you from the person you did it for, or get yourself into heaven, you haven't done anything good at all. You've just been selfish. For Luther, for a work to be finally be good, it must be done to get nothing in reward for yourself. You feed the hungry and clothe the naked simply because they need it. Not to get any points for yourself from God, not to get yourself in for, into heaven, not even to get a thank you from the person for whom you've done this good deed. If you do it simply because it needs to be done, looking for nothing in return yourself, then you've finally done something that's truly good. My question is, do any of us ever in this life actually pull off such an act. And I want to close by just throwing one thing out to you from Luther to, to get a sense again of how radical his thinking was along these lines. Um, and uh, the funny thing is, um, because Luther sort of redefines good works, he he, he often said, works don't get us into heaven, which gave the early Lutherans this reputation of being against good works. I would argue that's totally wrong. Luther loved good works. He just wanted good works to truly be good, to be done for all the right reasons, for the person who needs them, not for the person doing them. Um, and so here's an example of Luther playing off one of the commandments, the commandment, you shall not steal. And um, Luther looked at that commandment and looks at what is the spirit of this commandment. And in looking at that commandment, Luther said, when God gives this commandment that we shall not steal, 
What God really intends is not only that we don't steal, but that we help our neighbor in all of his or her physical needs. And this is how radical that goes for Luther. In Luther's mind, if I have something, if I own something, and you need it, it's no, mo no longer mine. It now belongs to you. In fact, the reason God gave it to me was so that I could share it with you. Luther pushes this so far even as to talk about the beer in his vat. Now we could talk about, I suppose, the beer in the fridge. But Luther would say, even the beer in the refrigerator was given to love your neighbor, not to be used for yourself. So in Luther's mind, everything we have has been given to us to be used for the sake of our neighbors. And if my neighbor needs it and I have it and I don't give it to my neighbor, in Luther's mind, then I am stealing. I am breaking the commandment, you shall not steal. Now, how does that stand in a society, our society, that is all about how much we can get and how much stuff is mine? It's extremely countercultural. A whole different way of looking at life and thinking about things. So again, I hope this lecture, I hope everything we've talked about so far is spurning you to have some conversations with family members, with people you work with about some of these ideas. Um, throw them out. See what kind of reactions and conversations you get with others. And I, I hope you're having some fun with this. Thank you.